All right, we're at 12.02, so I'm gonna get started. I'm Kim Richter, I'm Professor of Population Health at um, <clears throat> University of Kansas Medical Center. And I'd like to um, welcome you guys to our uh, today's uh, Research and Discovery Grand Rounds. Before we get started, um, Ashley Carlson, who um, we all need to thank for doing such a great job coordinating this whole series, is gonna um, pass uh, walk us through a few uh, slides that we need to show before we get started. Okay, so just wanna go over conflicts of interest. Um, a number of committee members and speakers have no actual or potential uh, conflicts of interest, and uh, that includes a number of folks. Uh, there are a few that have disclosed financial relationships, and those relevant financial relationships were mitigated. Okay, so um, please, please save the date for the next Grand Rounds. It's going to be on Thursday, August 25th. And we're going to have Bill Brooks, Nihar Nayak, and Natalia Luskutova from Frontiers present on the CTSI pilot funding opportunities for translational research. This is a tremendous opportunity to get pilot money to do um, startup research, and uh, they're going to give you all the ins and outs of how that process works. Okay. So without more ado, I'm going to introduce to you Stacy Farr while she's pulling up her slides from, can I, can I tell where you are, Stacy? <laughs> sure, that's fine. <laughs> Colorado, Aspen, <laughs> wish we could all be there. So thanks so much for cutting into your vacation to give this presentation, Stacy. Well, it's nice to know how much she prioritizes her commitment to Frontiers, so I'm impressed. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. And uh, and it's, it's just it's just a little bite out of the beginning of her vacation. So hopefully she'll forget all about us uh, just as soon as the talk is done. Um, so Stacy Farr, Dr. Farr, is Director of Outcomes Research uh, for Kansas City uh, Quality and Value Innovation Consortium, or KC Cubic, and is also Director of Outcomes Research at St. Luke's Health System. And she's on the research faculty in the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine for the Department of Biomedical and Health Informatics. As a trained health services researcher in health policy and public health, she brings over 10 years of experience managing research and policy projects and conducting mixed methods program evaluations on a variety of health-related topics. Now, I understand that John Spurtis is not actually going to be giving part of the presentation, and we weren't sure just how present he was going to be on the panel, but since I can see you, John, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you as well. So John Spurtis is a cardiologist in the Lauer, Missouri Endowed Chair and Professor of Medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he serves as Clinical Director of Outcomes Research at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. He's a graduate of UCSF Medical School and completed his internal medicine, cardiology, and health services training at the University of Washington. He served on a ton of different national committees, um, and his research activities led to his in induction into the American Society of Clinical Investigation in 2006 um, and the Association of University Cardiologists in 2018. And he also received the American Heart Association Quality of Care and Outcomes Research Council's Distinguished Achievement Award. Um, so we have two distinguished uh, presenters, one who's going to be sort of ghosting in the background, that'll be John, and Stacy is going to be driving all the slides. Um, so I think we'll turn it over to you, Stacy. Oh, and also, guys, if you want more um, information on the background or activities of Stacy and John, please go to the KC Cubic website. They've got wonderful bios there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Director. That was great. Um, and yes, greetings from Aspen. I do not have um, cowboys holding footballs hanging up in my own home, but <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. So, so today we're going to present, you know, building the infrastructure to cross the final frontier of translational science. More, This is more information about um, HiIQ, which is the Healthcare Institute for Innovations and Quality. And advance here. So today I'm going to share, you know, um, you know, some more like some background really with this and then how we formed high IQ, more about regional quality improvement, our training and education, community engagement, and opportunities for frontiers investigators as well. So, you know, first in terms of background, you know, why should we all care about, you know, improving the quality and value of healthcare? You know that we we know that the U.S. spends more per capita on healthcare, 
And so this graph here shows, you know, comparing the U.S. to other OECD countries, we can see that, you know, spending of our GDP or gross domestic product per capita um, on the x-axis and then healthcare spending on the y-axis. And as a general trend, you know, you can see the outlier of the U.S. up here where, you know, we're a major outlier, right, and spending far more than any other industrialized country on healthcare. Um, so there's that. Also, our costs are increasing the fastest in the US. So when you look at healthcare costs, you know, kind of over time, this trend here from 1970 onward, you can see that costs are increasing the fastest in the US. Um, and for the past 50 years, the gap between healthcare spending as a share of the US economy compared to other OECD countries has really widened. We started out at around, um, you know, I think it's uh, we, where we were spending about 6% of our GDP on healthcare, and and now we're around 17. So this is not a good trend, um, especially for the size of our GDP. And so, you know, despite kind of um, spending the most, you know, for all those, for all that spending, we should have the best outcomes, right? Well, you know, we don't. Um, and so despite spending the most, the U.S. really has worse improvements in life expectancy compared to other OECD countries over time. We can see that since 1980, um, life expectancy between the U.S. and other countries, you know, has widened. That gap has widened. And, um, you know, we really obviously need to change those outcomes. In terms of some other health outcomes, like health status, we can see that we're also getting worse over time. So, this is a graph um, showing kind of 2011 in the light blue and 2017 in the dark blue. And we can see that, you know, the percentage of adults who are reporting worse general health, um, meaning fair or poor health status overall, you know, for overall and then by different categories, we can see that for the, for overall, for females and for whites, that um, we are getting worse over time while these other groups have re remained relatively flat. And so, we're definitely not improving our health status over time. In fact, it's getting worse for some groups. We also see that when we look at hospitalizations and healthcare utilization here, we can see that the US hospitalizes more patients than in other countries. And um, so on this graph, you can see in green is the US compared to other comparable you know, OECD countries. And we can see that the US hospitalizes more often for diabetes um, and congestive heart failure um, quite dramatically. In other countries. And, you know, that, you know, stems from a variety of reasons, oops, which we can discuss, you know, later, but some of those are things about how we invest in our healthcare system, about preventative services, about social determinants of health and social health investments, or, you know, kind of lack thereof that are, that the U.S. has traditionally been doing compared to other countries. And then this slide is an, um, kind of an interesting uh, infographic from, uh, it was in the Lancet, where we can see that the U.S. also has some of the worst health disparities and health inequities compared to other countries. And so um, in the top, um, this is really kind of using the Gini coefficient, which, you know, is a measure of statistical dispersion between, um, you know, to represent, I guess, the uh, income wealth inequality. And we can see that the U.S., you know, is um, right here, 0.394, is, you know, one of the most unequal countries in the world, honestly, with health outcomes widening between different income groups. And then um, on the bottom of this, we can see a number of different health outcomes and across a number of health outcomes, those with lower socioeconomic status um, or being non-white are predictors of worse health outcomes. And so, for example, you know, here on the left, it's life expectancy. If you look, you know, between males and females um, from the richest and the poorest, you can see the 10 year gap in life expectancy for women, 10.1 and 14.6 for males. And then when you move into kind of access to care, um, you can see, you know, that, um, you know, 39% of um, individuals who have low income are, are not getting the medical care they should. And, you know, this just goes on, this goes on to, you know, how people are paying more. And so if we look at a share of income that people are paying for private insurance, the low income, um, the lowest uh, fifth, I guess, um, in income group, you know, they're paying 6% versus the wealthiest only paying 3.2%. And also that one in 10 are having financial hardships, you know, just paying medical bills um, or having bankruptcy. And then in terms of the healthcare workforce and um, kind of some racial ethnic um, disparities, we can see that, you know, 
the U.S. Healthcare system employs more than 20% of Black female workers in the U.S., um, but also more than a quarter of those are subsisting on family incomes that are below 100% of the FPL or federal poverty line. And so we just need to think about ways where we can um, really improve our healthcare system to reduce a lot of these inequities. And, you know, something that's have uh, that have come up. These problems, you know, they're not new. These have come up over time for many decades. And, you know, as a result of a lot of these problems that our country was actually seeing in even the 90s, um, you know, we started realizing that we needed to change care. We needed to make healthcare in the U.S. safer. We needed to make it more effective. We needed to make it more, more patient-centered, more timely, more efficient, um, and more equitable. And these really came out through a lot of um, the kind of the landmark reports from the Institutes of Medicine and the National Academies of Medicine, um, who many of you know, and this started really in the 90s um, with, you know, kind of the first report um, to Air as Human, and then also, um, you know, the latter um, report that followed after that, which was Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new healthcare system for the 21st century. And that latter report really kind of laid out a call to action for the U.S. and kind of achieving those six domains. And, you know, even though these reports are a couple decades old now, some of the things are still the same. Um, and so a lot of these things still stand today and that we really need to um, focus on addressing. All right, so so then, you know, so what is healthcare value? So we, we see that things cost a lot, our outcomes aren't great, what is healthcare value? And while this really does vary, you know, somewhat by stakeholder type, right? But like whose perspective are we speaking from? The general kind of equation is the same where, you know, healthcare value is really, you know, the quality of care we're delivering um, paired with the outcomes over the cost it is to deliver those um, care and outcomes. And when we think about healthcare delivery through the lens of value, um, we can really start to see wins for a number of stakeholders. So I really like um, this graph here or this figure that was shared by the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine um, Catalyst Innovations in Care Delivery, right, when they launched that new journal. Um, and they shared this kind of like what is value-based healthcare paper. And, and in here, you can kind of see that when we, when we you know, focus on achieving healthcare value, we can see wins for, um, you know, for patients, for providers, payers, suppliers, and for society. And so we know this is kind of where we need to go, what we need to do, right? So um, I guess a little more background. So the triple aim, for those of you who don't know, this has kind of been one of the, um, the guiding lights, so to speak, um, since really this, this paper, this is a landmark paper that came out, the triple aim, care, health, and cost, um, by Don Berwick, who was the head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the former um, president and CEO of Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And, you know, the triple aim, this paper came out in Health Affairs in um, 2008, same time as the Affordable Care Act was being passed, and just really became a guiding light for how the U.S. needs to move forward, which really means that we need to improve, you know, the the experience of care um, for patients, um, the health of populations, the outcomes, and then also focus on reducing the healthcare cost. And, you know, over the last few years, actually very recently, you know, this has been modified to kind of move into the quadruple aim of not just the experience of patients, but also thinking about the experience of the provider because of um, a lot of the provider burnout and care we need to provide to the providers, um, our healthcare workforces as we all know, has been uh, experiencing a lot of burnout. And then um, in 2022, um, just last year, has kind of moved into the quintuple aim, where now not only do we need to obviously think about, you know, improving care outcomes and experience um, for both patients and providers but also, and reducing cost of care, but also to do all of this while trying to advance health equity because of everything we've seen about the growing inequities that we have. And so... From this, you know, one kind of strategy that's been, you know, recommended and done is really moving into, you know, the learning healthcare system approach where what um, in, let's see, I think it started around 2006, the Institute of Medicine, um, now National Academies of Medicine, convened a group of experts in a workshop on evidence-based medicine and like how we could actually re-engineer clinical research and healthcare to make it evidence more available, more applied in healthcare, more effectively, more efficiently. And uh, they released this um, uh, report in 2007, talking about a lot of different topics needed to cover for learning healthcare systems. And then in 2013, um, you know, the IOM or NAM again convened a group to 
uh, really talk about best care at lower cost, the path to continuously learning healthcare in America. And this, you know, because healthcare in the U.S. has gotten extraordinarily complex, um, and there's just a broad recognition that doing business as usual is not working. We're not achieving what we need to achieve in the way that we're currently working. And uh, I'm just going to share a couple other white papers for good background. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, released IHI Innovation System about how healthcare organizations could create their own innovation systems uh, based on their organizational needs to improve care delivery as well as um, whole system quality, which looks at kind of a whole um, holistic approach to how you can achieve healthcare system quality across different levels um, or different departments. And so, you know, with this background of where I guess the U.S. is at um, and where we need to go, we launched um, the Healthcare Institute for Innovations and Quality, um, which many of you also know as QVIC, the Quality and Value Innovation Consortium. Um, and you know, we have this vision really of Kansas City delivering the highest value, most equitable healthcare in the nation with our mission of really catalyzing and facilitating multi-stakeholder co collaborations to improve the quality and value of healthcare in Kansas City. And we're, you know, supported with our partners, um, BioNexus KC, um, we are housed at UMKC and partnered with um, University of Missouri Next Gen Precision Health Institute, as well as a part of the KU Frontiers Clinical and Translational Science Institute. And so, you know, why, so, you know, again, just kind of getting into this a little more, we can see, you know, in the status quo, I've given you a lot of background about why we are where we are, right, with the lower quality and the higher cost. And that's really where we've been in this environment of volume-driven healthcare that we have in the U.S., which is, you know, fee-for-service um, healthcare. And kind of as we move into more value-driven healthcare, which is focused on improving, you know, quality and delivering that at a lower cost, we know that we don't know how to get there. Healthcare systems don't know how to change care in order to get there. And so we created this regional strategy um, where we are using, um, you know, a partnership through high IQ of all the providers, researchers, purchasers, payers, community, and patients so that we can kind of take on, I guess, the, the shark of the um, changing healthcare um, payment and delivery systems. And right, <laughs> excuse me, and right now, um, each hospital, you know, in Kansas City, in the U.S., everywhere, each hospital is its own learning healthcare system, right? They take their learnings, apply them, and update their care accordingly so they can improve their patient outcomes. And what we're really trying to push to do is, is move instead from, from this kind of a framework, excuse me, <clears throat> into a uh, learning healthcare network where we get these hospitals to work together collaboratively. Um, and, and with the community to create a learning healthcare community, which we can all learn and improve together. And so, you know, how do we do this? Um, how our regional quality improvement, you know, kind of works um, is we start with, you know, a lot of our hospitals and researchers within the hospitals, we identify the appropriate clinical champions for each of the um, interventions or projects, and then the committed and um, researchers. And, they then partner and work with um, our advisory board, as well as different content experts and community resources and organizations and the payers through kind of designing the intervention to begin. And then from there, really the researchers using implementation science methods, which I'll talk about, um, and customizing the implementation with each of the hospitals and then measuring those outcomes and using feedback um, and implementation science to kind of refine those interventions over time. And so in terms of implementation, just getting ready, right? Um, I'm, I shared this slide, which is a really great, um, I, I just love this one. So this is the subway map, right, for implementation. But this article was released by Megan Lane Fall um, in 2019. She's at Penn and um, is an implementation scientist and her uh, physician. And really to help kind of new implementation scientists and researchers identify like where their research questions um, fall in terms of the translational research spectrum and kind of help with what kind of study design you need based on the research questions you have and based on where the status of the evidence is. And so you kind of start with, you know, the practice or program that you're or intervention that you're looking to do and whether or not it has efficacy, you know, in kind of that tightly controlled environment. Um, you know, and if it does, you know, can you move into effectiveness, which is really that real world, um, you know, 
um, efficacy. And then from there, is that something that's effective, you know, partially or not, you know, so you can just determine if you're doing hybrid type trials where you're looking both at Im implementation, but effectiveness or, or where you lie. And so we like to use this as um, helping guide uh, researchers on where they should start. And then in terms of the key activities, how we kind of organize some of the steps and processes of this regional quality improvement that we're doing, you know, with, and also advice, I guess, for anyone that wants to do this kind of work is really starting with, um, you know, the goals and outcomes you have with the project, starting to select the frameworks you have for uh, implementation, as well as um, a framework for evaluation. And that's, you know, some of those can be two of this, you know, one of the same, um, you know, for example, some of the logic models or re-aim, some of the frameworks that are implementation frameworks can also work for evaluation, but sometimes you have separate ones. Um, we can also then define the participants for each of the projects in terms of clinical champions and the research teams. And then we start to map some of the implementation strategies, um, define the measures and data sources. Uh, and then a lot of the um, the really unfun things to me, but you know, like the IRB, the legal and data sharing issues. And when you're working across multiple hospitals, those are, you know, legal agreements um, for their participation. And then, you know, supporting the implementation and evaluation of those projects. And I'm going to talk about this you know, a little more. So, oh, sorry. And then transitioning to sustainability. And so this slide, okay. So, um, you know, this um, article is, um, you know, kind of a, a really well-cited, we all understand that it takes, you know, far too long for us to get evidence integrated into clinical practice or into communities. And and this article by Morris et al. really looked at and gave us that answer of, you know, 17 years is the average amount of time it takes us to generate evidence to get that into clinical practice. And we know that, you know, we've got to reduce that. And that's kind of the, the reason for a lot of this work. And also we know that um, this came from uh, Meslin et al. and their colleagues really looking at kind of the valleys of death in translational research. And so there's these different, you know, uh, translational research types, right? Like T1, 2, 3, and 4, and where you're really moving from, you know, discovery, basic bench research in T1 down to T4, where you're moving evidence all the way into communities. Um, but these valleys of death can occur, right? For anywhere from when you're creating the innovation at, you know, if it's a drug, for example, you're creating that in the labs to, you know, whether or not that then works in certain populations, whether that makes it into evidence-based practice guidelines into the T3 spectrum and then into healthcare practice to a broader community. And so trying to find ways where we can um, reduce seeing, uh, uh, having some of our, our work fail in those valleys of death is important. And we recognize that we really need to use implementation science in order to do that, right? So, um, you know, the, which is really the science of planned human behavior change under organizational constraints. And so to kind of put high IQ and how we kind of work within frontiers, you know, we really see ourselves as key in frontiers in terms of achieving some of these translational science efforts where, um, you know, certain groups are more, this gets to the, the T spectrums as well, where certain groups are more in the knowledge generation um, and the CTA say, uh, sorry, um, the trial innovation networks where they're really establishing the efficacy of some of these the evidence that's been generated and we're supported by, you know, this informatics infrastructure to help us measure whether or not we're successful. But where we really see high IQ then is once we have these evidences that have been, that have shown efficacy and are ready for kind of real world scale that we can really translate those into clinical practice and in our community. Um, and there we are, high IQ. So, so okay, so now I'm going to pivot a little bit into kind of some of the how we got to the projects we're currently working on. So high IQ to make this a little more concrete. So we started um, in 2018 by really convening, actually, I, I mean, going to all the stakeholders in Kansas City. And that included, this is just a snapshot of those on the left, but we started by going to different hospitals, including, you know, the C-suites of the hospitals. We went to the payers. We went to the community-based organizations. We met with researchers. We met with um, patient groups, we met just kind of a needs assessment in Kansas City to understand healthcare priorities. And, you know, we met with you know, just kind of a, a stakeholder composition of who we met with. It was, you know, over 35 organizations, over 200 stakeholders. And to really understand 
and our intent with those interviews was really to get at the strategic priorities, healthcare priorities in our region and what was most important um, so that when we high IQ were gonna undertake some quality improvement projects, we made sure we were in line with the priorities in our region. Um, and so from all of those interviews, um, we distilled that down to a number of quality improvement topics, you know, that we had obtained from all these leaders. And those were 32 different topics um, right here from the uh, interviews. And from there, we employed a survey to kind of talk to all the healthcare leaders and say, okay, from your lens, what is not only the most important, but what is also actionable? Um, because we also know that some things may be a priority, but may not necessarily be actionable for a group like us. Um, and one example of that is, um, you know, the need for more psychiatric beds is a huge issue in Kansas City. And clearly, you know, the health, you know, high IQ wasn't able to, we're not, we don't have the right certifications, resources, et cetera, to go out and build, you know, hospitals. Um, so that's clearly like a priority in our region, but not something that we could tackle. And so from, you know, that survey, we identified, um, we narrowed the list down to 11 topics that were both high priority and actionable. And then we started using those topics in our community forums, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, at those forums, we, imp we uh, implemented a nominal group technique to kind of vote on what was the most relevant, actionable, and important topics for our region, but from a broader community lens. And uh, from there, we um, collapsed that down to five topics where we then took those five topics to our strategic advisory board, which is made up of, you know, a number of stakeholders in our region, the payers, the hospital associations, uh, philanthropy patients, um, purchasers, et cetera. And so we went to this advisory board and we kind of used criteria that's very similar to like NIH grant submissions, right? Like what are, you know, what's the topic appeal, impact, importance, feasibility, um, you know, what's actionable, et cetera. And we use those criteria and really kind of narrow down our list of topics to two topics for can, for the for high IQ to take on first. And those were opioid management and transitions of care for heart failure, um, kind of emphasizing social determinants of health and population health approaches. So that's how we came up with our priorities. And then once we had the priority topics, um, we also had three strategies by which we wanted to improve quality and value in Kansas City. And so our three main, um, I guess, strategies or activities are our regional quality improvement projects. And so those are the ones I've been talking about. So the two topics being opioid management and transitions of care for heart failure. This is a, a map of Kansas City and kind of the hospitals who have been participating in those regional quality improvement projects. But, you know, in order to actually do that regional quality improvement work, we knew that we needed to also, um, um, train and educate the not just the researchers, but also the clinical teams in how to change care, because it's not easy, as we all know, anyone who's done this work knows. Um, and so we developed um, Tiara, which is training and implementation, actionable research approaches. And this was a, um, a certificate program through Frontiers that we had launched. And really, um, I'll talk about it a little more later, um, the next phases, but that really allows um, for kind of the pragmatic learning of implementation science to take for QI projects in the region. And then our third activity is the QVIC forum. And this is a, a monthly forum that we have that focuses on all of those healthcare priority topics in our region where we bring multiple stakeholders together and you hear small little presentations from maybe from a payer, from a provider, from a purchaser, from a patient, but they're all in the same topic. And then we use you know a panel at the end to use and discuss. And those have been really rich um, community learning activities and a lot of when they were in person, a lot of business card sharing, a lot of really great networking and finding new partners. Um, and online, I think a lot of email exchanges after. <laughs> and so those are our three topic or our three main strategies. But and then to dig a little bit more into our oh, let me check my time into our two regional projects. So again, we have opioid management, um, which is we're we're currently working on a program called Epic. It's engaging patients in care coordination. This is a partnership we are doing with the Missouri Hospital Association. Um, 
and you know in the interest of time i'm not going to get into these in great length um because i have other things to to cover before q a but i'm happy to take questions about it but at the highest level this is an ed based kind of intervention where patients who show up uh present to the ed um and actually we partner also with ems but where they present with an acute opioid use disorder kind of overdose and they get stabilized and connected to peer recovery coaches who um peer recovery coaches are those are individuals who've gone through the recovery they've they've had opioid use disorder they've gone through recovery they've gone through training and now they really may meet these patients where they're at and help connect them to community-based treatment and these models have um, been shown in a number of other places to be really successful in getting more adherence to treatment so we're working with a number of hospitals on as i had mentioned on the missouri side with that project and then we have our transitions of care for heart failure project which this one is really kind of a suite of interventions that hospitals can use and select from. Um, this is our heart failure carousel where, you know, um, patients with heart failure present to the emergency department with their heart failure. Um, you know, we implement one of our programs, it's called Code HF, um, you know, in the ED to see whether or not that patient could be um, safely admitted home versus admitted to the hospital. Um, then, you know, if a patient is admitted to the hospital, we are, one of our other projects is working on um, connecting those patients from the inpatient side to their payer disease management programs to help with their um, management of their conditions once they transition home. And then another one of our projects is focused on that transition home um, and connecting patients who have social determinants of health needs um, to community resources and connecting them in a way where they have um, uh, there are contracted services. We know the services are there and someone else is helping to coordinate those services for them. And we're doing a um, randomized trial um, across a number of hospitals on that one. So I'll get into that a little more, but I can also ask, answer any questions about those regional QI projects later. And so to give you a, a quick snapshot, just using our transitions of care project, um, this is one of our dashboards. And so I had mentioned code HF, which is that ED based algorithm for um, the patients who come to the ED with shortness of breath or a history of heart failure. This is our dashboard showing by hospital, um, kind of where they're at in um, working with us. And this just kind of gives us a high level snapshot of seeing how the regional QI is working. So you can see a number of hospitals interested and in where we have um, had the most maturity. So this has been fully implemented and evaluated with high success at um, St. Luke's. And then with I um, particular, I mean, there's a lot of things I find particularly interesting about this project, but one of which is that we've been able to successfully work across EMRs. I think that's a really novel thing that you don't see a lot. Where So you know, the code HF was built, you know, within EPTIC and we were able to work with Cerner, launch it also in Cerner and then work with hospitals on either, you know, EMR platform and implement this at their site. And then we also have our payer disease management program, which I, um, I mentioned connects the patients to um, payer disease management programs to manage their heart failure at home. We are working on the pilot currently um, at St. Luke's and we have some other hospitals beginning to express interest in that as we refine that program. And then the um, MSN for social determinants of health, this is the one I had mentioned that was for the patients with identified social determinants of health needs at the point of discharge from a hospital, they get connected to um, the Mid-America Regional Council and we are doing a randomized trial where we randomize patients to receive 90 days of those services or not and come see how that affects their, um, you know, their quality of life, their healthcare utilization and other health outcomes. And then um, AHA implement HF, um, we high IQ are a um, partner with the American Hospital Association in their their national initiative called Implement HF. Um, but we are also working um, at the site level, a partner for them to be um, to work with them on coordinating a lot of the stakeholders in using implementation science to essentially get more adherence to get with the guidelines and and improve uh, decrease mortality and improve outcomes for patients with heart failure. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of whizzing through because I'm realizing I have so many slides. So, but I can answer any questions about those. Um, so that kind of, so to now move from our, our regional QI projects into a little bit more, I talked about that training and education, our second activity that we do. So um, we have our, it's called tiaras. I had mentioned training and implementation, actionable research approaches. And, you know, we really kind of combed uh, the literature to understand what are the competencies that, 
researchers need to have in order to um, understand implementation science and, and use that. And so we developed this curriculum. It was a four module based um, curriculum on the definition, background, and rationale of implementation science theory and approaches, design and analysis, and uh, excuse me, some practice-based considerations. And this was led by um, one of the godmothers in the field, um, uh, Dr. Ann Sales. And she, um, you know, was an editor at Implementation Science, the journal, now at Implementation Science Communications. Um, she uh, was with Michigan in the VA and is now with um, University of Columbia um, and also with, um, has an affiliation with High IQ as well. And so we, we hosted these, um, this, um, sorry, we hosted Tiara as a certificate program. And then I think my next slide, let me look. Yeah, and so when we hosted Tiara the first time, um, this was in 2019, we had um, over 120 attendees at the Tiara sessions. I'll talk about the outcomes here in just a moment, but um, we also had 16 graduates. And so the picture here, I was just gonna say that is um, some of the graduates, and yes, they're wearing crowns because of the name of this. We got everyone who graduated from the program received a crown or tiara. So you can too when you enroll. <laughs> um, but um, across the tiara, what we saw was 64% uh, 64 of attendees increased their level of DNI expertise from you know, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. 27% uh, stayed the same level and 9% uh, decreased. Um, and so when I, I when we actually reflected on this and kind of spoke with people, what we really think why we would think we would see a decrease was really that I think some people maybe thought they were more of an expert in implementation science until they started really getting into it a lot more, right? And then they kind of realized how big and how much there was to learn, which I actually think still speaks volumes to the program. But, um, and then also that knowledge levels increased across all eight competencies. And, um, and so that was in the first offering. And then we're currently preparing for um, Tiara 2.0, I guess as I'll call it. Um, what we're doing now is, we are building the certificate program again through Frontiers um, 3.0 um, and also through High IQ. And there will also be opportunities for CE for that. And that will be in 2023. And then we also have starting this fall um, at UMKC and I believe also in parallel at KU. Um, but we have a graduate level course, a three credit hour course that um, myself and Dr. Daniel Olds are co-instructors for, um, with the support of Dr. Ann Sales, who is also teaching this at University of Missouri. And then our, our kind of third bucket, I had said that we had the regional QI, we have our training education, and we have community engagement. And so um, I'm going to point anyone here to um, uh, Pat McDonald's email address if anyone wants to get on our mailing list that is not already and wants to learn more about the forum, um, please do go there. But but our forum is, you know, we have monthly um, forums where these are the topics that we have for 2022. And this is really a great way to um, hear from a number of different stakeholders. Um, and this could be a community-based organization, a payer, a provider, a patient, um, a researcher. And they all just talk for, you know, 10 or so minutes on their lens on that topic, their expertise. And then we kind of bring everyone together at the end to really... Um, learn together and discuss solutions or things we can do in Kansas City. And um, we just had our alternative payment models one last week, which was really great. Um, and then you'll if you have if you're interested in our opioid management project, the one I had described, our regional QI project through High IQ, you can attend on August 18th and we'll be giving an update on that. And so I wanted to share also a few opportunities for any investigators or researchers with Frontiers with High IQ. And so again, as I mentioned, we have our course. So there's obviously our course. We'll be launching the Tiara Certificate Program in Implementation Science um, in 2023. Again, um, which we're very excited about. We also have our implementation collaboratories. So if you are a researcher with you know, some great ideas that you want to think about piloting or running um, you know, in, in a wet lab of hospitals or starting in one unit, um, we can help you kind of walk through that process, what that would look like. Also, if there are any, um, if you want opportunities to teach, um, to present, um, or you know, or just even to attend, you can come to our forum or you can reach out to us if you 
have a certain area or a topic that you saw on that list or that you think for next year, um, we'd love to have presenters as well. And so to on that last slide, I said the implementation collaboratory. So just to get a little more uh, in depth on that. So really, you know, the steps kind of in this would be that, you know, the PIs develop their idea and their proposal, um, and they can work with high IQ on kind of the design, implementation, evaluation of the intervention, what that should look like. Um, and then there's potential opportunity, you know, based on the evidence and the refinement of that proposal um, and, and, this, and the alignment from our clinical side on maybe piloting that at a single site here in Kansas City amongst um, our 20 plus hospitals that we have here. And then if that's promising, then disseminate that regionally through high IQ so that you could um, do that at a number of other another number of other hospitals or clinical sites. And you know, some of those processes or steps that we've taken for our own regional QI that other investigators should be, I guess, aware of is, you know, kind of the pre-implementation. You know, I don't want people to get so excited and say, I have this really great idea. I'm ready to go. Let me go take it to this hospital and let's hit go. Um, we really have to make sure we have our ducks in, in line. And so, you know, the pre-implementation, which has a quite variable timeline, right, depending on just depending on the project and the level of complexity that it has, but it's really kind of identifying the background, the objectives, aims, your research questions, who is on your, you know, team in terms of research and clinical, what are your frameworks that you're using, what's kind of a high level process flow map, um, what data collection tools um, are you going to be using, you, need, you know, in developing those. And then consulting with high IQ, um, also working on IRB, and then um, participation scopes of work. And so this is a kind of a different thing to research. But when you're working kind of clinically, you know, we have, um, you know, to uh, we have through high IQ these, um, you know, legal regulatory agreements with hospitals to get them to work with us on projects and share data with us. And so for each of those, we have new scopes of work. And so it's also working on those scopes of work as well as doing determinants assessments, um, which are, you know, if you're not an implementation scientist, determinants essentially mean the barriers and facilitators. And so kind of understanding those. And then we work on implementation, um, you know, high level, the, the kickoff meetings, process maps, refining your strategies and collecting data, and then really some of the outcomes evaluation, the effectiveness, using mixed methods, um, thinking about sustainability and spread and dissemination. I'm sorry, I feel like I was really rushing wrapping up here. So kind of in summary, I wanted to share that, you know, U.S. healthcare, we've seen this needs monumental, innovative change. We need to move to value-based healthcare. The major funders, particularly, you know, CMS or major payers, I should say, are moving that direction. Um, you know, learning health communities uh, like High IQ, where we're thinking outside of the box and working with all stakeholders in the community can help to ease this transition while also improving the value and equity of healthcare in our community. And that there are multiple opportunities for frontiers investigators to engage, learn, and contribute to these changes in the wet lab, um, so to speak, that High IQ has created. And with that, I would like to thank you and open up the floor. Unless John yes, has any yeah. other comments. <laughs> oh, John, yeah, go ahead. No, no, look, I, I'm very, uh, you know, this has been a long, heavy lift trying to, you know, bring this together. And uh, I think Stacy represented it very well. I'd be very interested in, in sort of questions from the audience and, um, you know, learning how we can get people engaged and how we can do better. So am, am I right, Ashley, um, that can people unmute now and ask questions or do they need to um, type their questions into the chat? Are they muted for good? Yeah, we're using a webinar format so folks can use the chat or the Q&A box to submit their questions to the panel and then our facilitators will read out your questions so our, our speakers can answer them. Okay, great. And um, Stacy, I know we had gone through how you can open up that uh, chat box. Um, and I don't know if you can open up the Q&A box, but so while uh, you're doing that, I thought maybe I'd, I'd throw out a question and other people um, can be typing your questions into the chat. But I was wondering if um, you um, could share the experience of someone who have, has brought like a, um, a research idea to you and how you guys walked them through the different phases 
uh, pre-implementation, implementation, et cetera, and how just uh, to give a picture of how that worked. And if you could mention, you know, who they should, people should reach out with, um, how to get in touch with you, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, and so this is actually kind of a new, uh, a new, the implementation collaboratories are a little bit new. And so I would say that, you know, we've recognized through kind of the formation of high IQ and our own regional quality improvement projects that, you know, these are the steps that make the most sense, right? Like we kind of walked through these as a team. We identified a lot of researchers in the region and we're working, you know, in, in these large teams and we've recognized these steps that all needed to be done. And so I think through our collective learning, we've identified that we now can kind of open this up to these implementation collaboratories, which is a new theme in Frontiers okay. 3.0. And so I do think that we're, you know, we're very excited to think about how we can best do that. We also, you know, want to be realistic and pragmatic with how, you know, how mature ideas need to be in order to bring them to clinical sites. Um, and so we want to make sure that if investigators have these great ideas and interventions that we um, can help them be the most ready so that the clinical sites are open to it and very engaged as well. Um, I don't know, John, if you so, want to. Yeah, I mean, I, I might say that, you know, the, the earlier projects that were brought to us uh, were aligned with the Transitions in Care and Heart Failure Project. So, um, and, you know, frankly, you know, we're getting better. I mean, this is a, you know, a new science and a new field for us. And we have, um, you know, when, when people brought ideas, you know, we worked with them in um, sort of conceptualizing an implementation strategy. We did bring in outside experts like Ann Sales to help weigh in on a lot of that. And then we, we've just gotten much, much better over time. I think the critical issue, and Nancy Stewart raised this question about bringing a, a research idea that has been very humbling to us as we have gone in this way. As, as investigators, we normally exert a lot of control over a project. You know, we, we know what we want to do. We design the experiment or the study or the project, and we implement it. Here, um, because we're working with so many diverse partners, we actually um have to sell the ideas and can only pursue those with partners who are really interested and and really bought our sales pitch it's a it's been a very humbling and different strategy for trying to do work than um i'm traditionally used to i've been doing this a long time and, and this is a new area for me um but i think it's really amongst the most important uh, challenges in realizing a lot of the potential that the entire CTSA network and frankly the entire cl clinical research infrastructure is done as we develop a lot of evidence and it just doesn't get used. I mean, it, you know, it, it takes usually about 17 years after something's endorsed in the guidelines before it's routinely adopted in clinical care. And, and, and that's just unacceptable. And you know, a lot of the high IQ strategy is trying to leverage external forces that are creating a need to change for health systems. And so the movement to value-based healthcare, you know, when we launched this, it was before Trump entered office. And so there was tremendous momentum in Obamacare and in uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's vision to have value-based care be the way all of Medicare was financed. And hospitals were very ill-prepared to uh, survive in that environment in our region. And so there was a tremendous need and opportunity. And then it got you know, derailed when price sort of took that off the table. And uh, but nevertheless, you know, people acknowledge this is where we have to go. Clearly, the uh, local payers are very concerned about trying to optimize care and outcomes while lowering and bending the cost curve. And so there is a lot of opportunity, but we don't drive it nearly as much as I wish we did. We are very subservient to the, the will, passion, and commitment of the participating partners throughout the region and largely because they're paying for all the work. We're not paying for it. You know, they're not yeah. making money off of so, this. So. so John, let's say, uh, so for Nancy, let's say she's got a great idea and it may even dovetail with some of the priorities that you guys have identified. How how would she connect with you guys to get the dance started? Right, so it, it, right now connecting with Stacy, whose information is here, Pat McDonald, me, 
And what we would do is, you know, we would try and understand where she is. We probably would encourage her to present to a multidisciplinary research conference we host on Wednesday mornings as an initial step. And then we would work really one-on-one -on -one with her to figure out the best strategy to try and implement her idea in this region. Or, you know, we have a lot of connections nationally, you know, in other areas. Um, and, you know, if it fit here, then, it, you know, we would want to make sure that she was committed for the long run. I mean, these projects take a long, long time. And if she's the champion for this project, but really has one year before she graduates, it, that's a non-starter. But if she's committed to really, you know, not just getting a paper, just getting a grant, but really implementing her idea of clinical care, that's a key hurdle for her to pass for us to do it. And then we're all in, you know, right. I mean, if there is interest in the parties and there's yeah. a clinical champion, we're to support infrastructure to have her be successful because, you know, ultimately it's good for our region. Absolutely. And uh, so I know Nancy's here for the long haul for sure. So she'll probably be reaching out to you, Stacy. I know that Fran Hu is asking about what evaluation model uh, will be used? And um, my guess is it might be for your whole initiative, like, um, or it might be for um, particular initiatives. So I don't know, Stacy, if you want to reflect on both those levels or just one. Sure. No, definitely. And I, so I would start by saying, um, you know, I'll start with high IQ within our projects. You know, we are using different frameworks for different projects. And I think that would carry forth into anyone else's projects. And we would, uh, I guess I'll get into the individual researchers in a moment, for, but for high IQ, you know, we're working currently, we're usually using a lot of um, implementation and evaluation frameworks simultaneously. So we've been using CIFR, we've been using REAIM. Um, we are using logic models, both traditional logic models for evaluation, but also we're using um, the, the enhanced ones, the, the, which is like the implementation research logic model or IRLM. And so we've been finding ways to incorporate the implementation aspects into tra traditional logic models. Um, you know, REAIM does have both implementation and evaluation in it, which is why it's been um, an interest in some of our high IQ projects, as well as, um, you know, we've talked about other, um, you know, like the SIP model, we've used as well, which is the context input process and product um, for evaluation. But I think, you know, that that's just at a very high level, kind of some of the frameworks we're using within high IQ. But I would say that, especially for, you know, researchers who are interested or wanting to work, you know, with us in this like implementation collaboratory sense, I think that you would identify, you know, and we can get more in detail, but I think, you know, you'd be identifying some of those things that you would prioritize right away. Like, here's my research questions, here are my aims, here's the framework I would intend to use, et cetera, so that you have uh, mature thinking kind of walking into it. And we're open to different frameworks because sometimes those make better sense based on different clinical questions, you know. Um, so I don't know. If that yeah, I think that's a key point. You know, there, there are a lot of tools. I mean, I'm, I'm a cardiologist. If somebody came here and said, well, how are you going to treat my heart problem? Well, it really depends on what your heart problem is and what tests and what treatments you would offer it depends on whether it's an arrhythmia problem, a coronary artery disease problem, a heart failure problem, or something else. And so, you know, it's we are fortunate to have a broad array of frameworks. And, you know, for Fran, you know, a lot of different analytic strategies and approaches. One of the major investments that we've been making is trying to coordinate with the Missouri and Kansas Hospital Associations to be able to get all claims, you know, payer databases so that at sites that do implement something, are their outcomes different than sites that don't? And to take advantage of some of the natural experiments. And we have a, you know, a range of different statistical approaches for handling it. It all really depends on what the project is. And one of the great opportunities of this resource is to be able, uh, I mean, look, we're all in the same community, all in the same family, all in frontiers, you know, we're here to help so we can sit and think through with you, you know, you know, and try and get a deep understanding of the project. Currently, we fold them into our outcomes research seminars as sort of the first step to start vetting ideas and getting input. And it, at some point, if there's enough interest to traction, we'll create a you know, implementation, science, high IQ sort of focused 
uh, weekly conference where people are able to present and exchange ideas and strategies and review results and troubleshoot problems and things of that sort. And, and um, that, oh, sorry, oh, John, I just uh, have a question from Mark and he he had Mark Clement here and he had put it in a little while ago and I make sure we get to it. Sorry. Yeah, that um, was what I suggest to go to. Was, oh, there we go. OK, great. Yeah, so, so, so Mark, so, so first yeah. of all, Mark is, you know, one of the people I, I'm, I'm most depressed with in the region with what he's built. And, you know, we are. Uh, we have not, you know, we envision providing a lot of consultative services to help, and they don't have to just be on projects going through QVIC, but to really help support and think through local QI projects is a resource that, you know, we currently have informally, we'd like to make more formal, but, you know, it would be really, you know, wonderful to have you, you know, present and to make sure we get a lot of the high Q faculty and others here to help think through, you know, either the design of your project before you're going to implement it or as you're implementing it, some of the challenges and how to overcome it or how to think about it, and how to parse out, you know, the effectiveness of the intervention versus the uh, success of the implementation. And there's ways that we can help work with you to create a framework that would make it far easier for you to go and be more successful on your own, even if we weren't leading or, or really heavily supporting the project, not that we aren't happy to support as much as we can. Great. So it sounds like um, uh, Mark and his collaborators would get in touch with Stacy, and then you guys would go from there on that. Yep. Okay, great. And Nancy had a question about the Wednesday morning research conference. If that's anybody something anybody can attend, and um, so I think maybe um, if if you and Nancy get together, Stacy and John, uh, then uh, you guys could iron that out as well. I mean, can uh, for everybody else can the morning research conference, Wednesday morning research conference is that is that open to other? Um, yeah, yeah. So in the uh, so Stacy put Pat McDonald's uh, yeah. um, contact information in the chat. And, oh, and reach out to her. So we we have a listserv. I, I think there might be 250 or 300 people on it uh, because over you know this this conference has been going on since Mark Clements was a fellow, um, and so it's been going on a long time. We have you know people from all over the country and in fact all over the world that participated in. But at any given week, there's usually 20 25 people participating. Uh, we had a really interesting presentation on. Um, um, uh, uh, cardio, peripartum cardiomyopathy and racial disparities and a woman doing a project in Nigeria to try and understand uh, uh, predicting cardiomyopathy early in pregnancy. And so, you know, it's a wide variety of topics that get discussed and we're doing more and more implementation presentations there. And um, it's always been available by Zoom. In COVID, that was the primary mode of distribution. Most people are still joining by Zoom, but we also uh, host it on the ninth floor of St. Luke's Hospital, which is the research floor. Wonderful. And it's actually top of the hour now. So I want to thank Stacy and John so much, uh, Stacy in particular, because you did the heavy lifting here, but John also for your, for your input and uh, everybody else who participated in the great questions. And I think, you know, the idea is just to reach out to Stacy uh, with your questions and, and ideas, and then you can get started. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at our next um, uh, uh, Grand Rounds in August. So um, I think with that, we'll say goodbye. Ashley, is there anything else you need to add? No, that's it. Thank you, everybody. For okay. Coming. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so Thank much, you. John. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, yeah thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.